2017 Suzuki GSX-R 1000R review. Ah, the legendary Phillip Island circuit, the scene of many epic battles among two-wheel gladiators like Gardner, Rainey, Schwantz, Corser, Stoner, Rossi, and Yannon, which has long been on my bucket list of racetracks to ride before I die. With significant elevation changes along 2.76 miles of twisting tarmac on the shores of the Indian Ocean, and an average GP speed of more than 110 miles per hour, it would be a challenge to learn on any bike, let alone on Suzuki's most powerful litter bike ever. Oh, and don't forget to dodge the seagulls and geese strolling around trackside, nor the goose that flew in front of me while I railed through Hay Shed Corner at a buck ten and missed me by just inches. The new Gixxer thou, the sixth generation known internally as the 7 Lira, has some big shoes to fill. A multi-time champion Rasabic since its 2001 introduction, it's been the better part of a decade since it was last updated in 2009, the K9. But based on my ride in Australia, Suzuki engineers have obviously been sweating the details to create what is surely the fastest and most capable GSX-R ever. This test is of the GSX-R 1000R, not the standard GSX-R 1000 we'll be riding in a couple of months. With an MSRP of $16,999, this Gixxer is now playing in the big leagues of superbikes, packed full of technology that previously had been mostly the purview of high-dollar European machines. Its 999.8cc power plant shrieks to 14,500 rpm and catapults the Gixxer down to 180 plus mile per hour by the end of Phillip Island's front straight. The standard GSX-R 1000 is new from the ground up and includes a raft of high-tech features like ride-by-wire throttle, variable valve timing, a finger follower valve train, Brembo monoblock brakes and a six-axis IMU intertile measurement unit. Its price starts at $14,599 and rises to $14,999 with ABS. To that the 1000R adds Showa balance-free suspension, quick shifter with auto-blipping downshifts, quartering ABS and launch control. A few clever tricks in the engine compartment bring hand of God power to the masses. Most interesting is an inventive variable valve timing system that has roots back to the late 1990s when the GSX-R's project leader, Shinichi Sahara, developed it with his colleague and then implemented it during Suzuki's original Moto program. Sahara Sen was the Moto technical manager from 2004 to 2010, and this ingenious VVT system, patented by Suzuki, was later adapted in 2012 for use on World Superbike and World Endurance GSX-R 1000 racing machines, and then recently to Moto America Superbikes, it's a remarkably simple mechanical system using an intake cam drive gear filled with a dozen steel balls that are spun outward at high revs by centrifugal force along slanted channels. The cam timing at lower engine speeds is in an advanced state for optimum grunt, but once past 10,000 rpm, the system retards cam timing to increase high rpm power. Another simple but clever solution is found in the mills intake. The Suzuki Dual Stage Intake SDSI, system is said to offer the advantages of variable length intake funnels without the added complexity and weight of a movable system. Suzuki's dual stage layout in two of the four intake funnels use a longer funnel positioned above a short funnel, with a gap between the two sections. At lower engine speeds, most of the air flows through the upper funnel, using the longer length to increase low and mid-range power. Then at higher revs, additional air flows around the base of the longer upper funnel and into the short lower funnel, increasing top and thrust. Further aiding breathing is a set of 2 mm bigger throttle bodies to 46 mm, incorporating one set of injectors in the body and another set of injectors spraying at their upper ends, directed by the AQ controlling throttle butterflies via a ride-by-wire system. Also new is the use of a finger follower valve train as developed in F1 Auto Racing and popularized on motorcycles by BMW with its class-topping S10,000RR. It's a lighter system than a typical bucket tappet arrangement, said to be 10 grams versus 16 grams, and its moving mass is further reduced to a claimed 3 grams, because each follower pivots on a fixed shaft, rather than a bucket placed directly on top of the valve stem. 
intake valve sizes go up by 1.5 mm to 31.5 mm, while exhaust valves transition from steel to titanium and shrink 1 mm to 24 mm, for a reduction of 8 grams each. The lighter valve train and its precise control, combined with a more over-square bore stroke ratio, and the abandonment of a balanced shaft has allowed the engine's rev limit to be raised 1,000 revs to a lofty 14,500 rpm. Engineers considered using a cross-plane style crankshaft arrangement popularized by Yamaha in its M1 and R1, and like Suzuki uses in its motorbike. bike, but that configuration forces a heavier engine block to contain the additional vibration and also saps some power relative to a traditional inline four crank layout. And with advancements in IMIS, that supply excellent traction control systems, any extra traction delivered from a cross-plane layout becomes negligible. All told, Suzuki claims 199 horsepower at 13,200 RPM, when tested at its crankshaft, a number that should translate to about 180 horses at its rear wheel. Torque remains similar to the previous edition at 86 pounds foot at 10,800 rpm. Somewhat disappointingly, Sahara Sam told me that noise restrictions in the USA will somewhat clip peak horsepower output compared to the European tuning of the bikes we rode, just like it does with Yamaha's R1 and Kiwi ZX10R in America. Sahara says USA bikes have the same power as Euro bikes up to 13,000 rpm, at which point the intake butterflies close slightly to reduce noise output. Now, before the internet pundits chastise Suzuki and America for nipping maximum power, please consider how often you're likely to be using full throttle above 13,000 rpm when riding on the street. This noise abatement strategy is only really an issue if you're a racer, and if you're a racer, you'll be retuning the engine anyway. Interestingly, I was given a brief look at a dyno chart by one of Suzuki's German test riders, Jürgen Plaschke, assistant manager, test, and technique. His chart showed the old Gixxer spat out 178 PS, slightly higher than our horsepower, while the 7 Lira GSXR churned out 203 PS, one further stroke more than the nearly omnipotent S1000R RBMW did on the same dyno. More is more, of course, but the chart's important distinction is the Gixxer's significant surfeit of power over the BMW from 9,500 to 13,000 rpm, demonstrating the advantages of Suzuki's VVT and other power broadening technology. Geez, I just burned a short novel's worth of words describing the engine before getting to any writing impressions, but I did so because it's the Gixxer's motor and the technology inside that is the most impressive part of this all-new bike. It pulls like a rocket powered by crystal mat, and its sonic profile at full song will raise the hairs on your neck as it wails to a previously unheard of 14 and a half freaking thousand RPM. I saw the speedometer on the nicely readable LCD instrumentation sail past 180 miles per hour lap after lap during my sessions, and that was even without shifting up to sixth gear. The motor's not quite flawless, though. Throttle pickup in the SDMSA mode can be slightly abrupt in slow corners, although it's completely smoothed out in B mode. Credit Suzuki for allowing the same peak power in all three of its ride modes, making neither of the softer settings just throwaway gimmicks. I preferred the sharper A mode on the racetrack, but I'd lean toward B mode if I was on a switchback Y Canyon road. The other aspect of the engine that wasn't entirely pleasurable was the vibration transferred to my hands. Remember, this is the first GSX-R1000 without a balanced shaft, taking another cue from the S1000RR, so additional vibes are going to be part of the package. I could feel the buzz via the handlebars, and most prominently through the edges of the fuel tank, when tucked in and leaned over. Four journalists I pulled, said the vibes didn't bother them, so this minor annoyance for me wasn't a problem for some others. Still, it's clearly felt relative to the former engine's relatively smooth character. Less noticeable is the the 1000 RS suspension, and I mean that in the best possible way. The fully adjustable Showa Balance Free suspension does a phenomenal job of controlling wheel movement, while still remaining supple enough to suck up bumps while leaned over. Suzuki started us out on street settings, which were perfectly acceptable to me, while I was getting up to speed on the fast and flowing Phillip Island circuit. Track settings were dialed in for our second session, which firmed up responses and kept the chassis composed. 
while I knocked seconds off my lap times. This latest Gixxer steers a bit quicker than the previous edition, although it's difficult to pinpoint exactly why. One reason is that a 190 55 replaces the flatter, old-style 50 series rubber. The 7 Lira GSXR has moderately sharper steering geometry, but a 15 mm longer wheelbase, which might balance their effects. New wheels with 6 thin spokes replace 3 spokers, but we weren't given specs on their relative weights. The swing arm is 40 mm longer, but is offset by a shorter distance from the front axle to the swing arm pivot, which is said to improve front end feedback. The frame itself is 10% lighter and 20 mm narrower, and it looks far more diminutive than I think a litter big frame could be. Fueled up and ready to ride, Suzuki says the Gixxer scales in at 448 pounds, quite a bit more than the recently reviewed 2017 Honda CBR1000RR, which tipped the scales at 425 pounds. Top shelf components are also found in the brake system, with Brembo supplying one-piece calipers and 320 mm rotors that combine traditional floating pin button carriers with Brembo's floating T-drive mounts. The brakes proved to have slightly less initial bite than some top-end Euro bikes, but it's not a problem for me, as I don't mind using more lever travel when grabbing a handful at 180 miles per hour. Sheer power is plentiful. The 1000R comes with a new motion track brake system regulated by the Yamu. It reduces rear wheel lift during maximum braking, and it also factors in lean angle. As my speed increased, so did my braking force, and at one point I felt some minor pulsing at the front lever when hammering on the binders into turn one. It wasn't really problematic, but I initially thought I might be experiencing the effects of a slightly warped brake rotor. For the next session, Suzuki gave us the opportunity to ride the bike with the ABS system deactivated. Oddly, Suzuki technicians had to disengage ABS by pulling a fuse, rather than using some sort of switch mechanism. Regardless, the pulsing, probably from the rear lift mitigation, wasn't felt again. In terms of other electronic rider aids, the Continental Inu and its traction control system proved to be excellent. I really appreciate the safety aspects to TC systems, but they're annoying when they intervene too soon or too abruptly. Suzuki offers 10 settings, and they're able to be adjusted on the fly by the mode button on the left switch gear, if the throttle is closed, off is also an option. TC3 was close to optimal for my preferences, as it still allowed the rear tire to slide without unwanted intervention. As the stock Bridgestone RS10s got used up, more sliding ensued. My only gripe with the system is that TC is also the method that controls wheelies. TC3 limits lifting the front tire to just a few inches, which is great for pinning the throttle and allowing the electronics to deliver maximum acceleration on a racetrack. TC2 allows larger wheel stands, and TC1 more again. But I'd prefer to be able to choose the wheelie ability independent of traction control selection. When I brought this up to Sir Harrison, he agreed with me that he'd prefer wheelie control separated from TC, leading me to believe we will see such an electronic upgrade in the future, if the product liability lawyers will allow it. No gripes at all with the quick shifter's performance. Upshifts are perfectly seamless, and the auto blipping downshifter nicely matched refs during downshifts, even when they weren't ideally timed. The system worked so well that thoughts about it drifted away to nothingness. On a slightly related note, the assist slip clutch has a light pull. Ergonomically, the new GSXR has an identical rider triangle to the older one, with bars, seat and footrests in the same positions we've enjoyed in years past. Bodywork and the fuel tank are slightly narrower, making the bike feel slimmer. Also narrower, by 13 mm, is the front fairing, which allows a bit more wind to hit a rider. However, the fuel tank is 21 mm lower, which lets a rider crawl into a modestly sheltered cocoon of still air. Bridgestone R10 race rubber was fitted to our bikes after lunch, which dramatically upped the grip levels. Their sharper profiles aided steering quickness, and I noticed their stiffer carcass aided front end feedback. I figured they might be worth a couple of seconds a lap over the RS10s, and Plashka reckoned they might net even more time. And the new GSX-R1000R is so capable that I was continuing to find new limits as I extracted new ways to go faster and faster. From what I was able to tell at Phillip Island, going quicker each time out 
I see huge potential for this 7 Lira GSXR platform, both for racy street riders and for pure racers. It wouldn't surprise me to see Tony Elias or Roger Hayden pull off a Moto America Superbike Championship in 2017. And maybe 2018. Engineers are always proud of the motorcycles they create, but Suzuki's team seemed particularly proud of their accomplishment with its latest GSXR, especially considering the typical modesty displayed by Japanese. Yet at the end of the Gixxer's presentation, Sahara San quipped. I would say to our competitors, who's your daddy?